This is my newest robot control PCB and in this video we'll be going through the schematic and PCB design so that by the end you won't have to worry about messing around with a giant electronic spaghetti and instead you'll be able to design your own all-in-one board. For this tutorial you're going to want to open KiCad 8, your favorite electronic parts supplier and a note-taking app. So let's go. Here we are in the schematic and the first thing I want to go through is the power circuitry. These first two lines form a reverse polarity protection circuit for the battery voltage with the LDO generating the enable voltage for the ideal diode IC to turn on the end channel power MOSFET. If you'd like to learn about what is, in my opinion, the best reverse polarity protection circuit, just click right here. After we've made sure the battery hasn't been plugged in the wrong way, we have a 5 volt buck converter to power some 5 volt sensors I had in the robot and the 5 volts is further regulated with an LDO down to 3.3 volts for the microcontroller on this board. I covered how to get the right circuit for your buck converter using TI Webench in the previous video, and of course the LDO is pretty straightforward, only requiring some capacitors for stability. Moving on, here we have an ESP32-S3 Room 1 module which I think is one of the best microcontrollers to get started with in PCB design, since it only requires a few passives, two buttons, and a stable 3.3 volt supply to get up and running. I've labeled most of the GPIOs by their pin name. However, IO19 and 20 are labeled D negative and D positive for the USB differential pair stuff to work on the PCB, and IOs labeled with an underscore at the end are the strapping pins and shouldn't be messed with except for GPIO0, which is responsible for boot mode. Underneath, you can see a bright 0805 on LED to indicate a good 3.3 volt supply and a 1515 size NeoPixel, because why not? All right, here are the motor drivers now. And while they seem simpler than you might think, it took some thorough reading of the datasheet to get to this configuration. I chose the hardware configured variant of the DRV A245 32 amp full bridge motor driver, hence the H, which basically means that a lot of the smart features of this chip are set through specific pull down resistors instead of through a nasty implementation of SPI. The way that I figured out how to configure this chip for these four settings, which I determined would make my coding job a lot easier, was to basically go to 9.2 typical application, read what each pin does, then skip back to 8.3.3 uh, device configuration and read through that, making sure to reference 5.4 configuration pins to know what resistor to place for each level of a setting. And for some reason, the slew rate settings were in 7.5.6 switching parameters. Yeah, that's boring, but if anything, when working with a Texas Instruments motor driver, chapters 7, 8, and 9 will help you actually put it into the schematic with its accompanying components. Further down, there's four 35 volt, 470 microfarad electrolytic capacitors to act as like backup reservoirs of energy so that the voltage ripple is reduced to a safe level, and some smaller SMD ceramics to go along with them. Now we can move over to the connector section of the schematic, where you'll find an FPC connector for the carrier PCB that I made, the output pads for the motors and battery and a USB-C connector, which is configured to output five volts with these 5.1K pull-down resistors and ESD protected with this USB LC6 2P6 chip. An important thing to note here is this seemingly random ground pad, which connects to the metal chassis of the robot through a one mega ohm resistor. This helps a lot with ESD protection and reliability, and I would highly recommend doing the same for your own robots if they have a metal chassis. Here I have a little box which shows me which GPIOs are connected to what, and this was all determined after the PCB components were laid out for optimal routing. All right, we're gonna move on to the PCB soon, but first, let's take a little break so I can tell you about this channel's sponsor, PCB Way. PCB Way offers top quality PCB fabrication and assembly, 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding, and even more at competitive prices. So if you want to check them out, head over to pcbway.com slash g slash x5f10h or pcb.hasindustries.com if that's easier for you to remember. Here's the PCB layout, and this is a four-layer PCB with almost solid inner ground planes. 
which really should have been completely solid, but it doesn't matter that much when you're dealing with low speed signals and don't care about EMC. On the top layer, I have some large copper planes connected to the motor drivers for current handling and heat dissipation, and I've tried to use planes as much as possible with this board because of the same benefits. The buck converter layout is pretty simple, and I paid close attention to this loop here, with one side of the inductor, the output capacitors, and the buck IC's output voltage pin being as close as possible. Moving over to here, I routed the USB differential pair with route differential pair, setting the differential pair trace width to 0.2 millimeters and spacing to 0.2 millimeters so that PCBWay could modify this and ensure a differential impedance of 90 ohms. Although the traces are barely a centimeter long and the 12 megabits per second of USB full speed is quite forgiving, so I didn't necessarily need to select this option when ordering. The other signals are routed using thin 0.2 millimeter traces in order to save space since barely any current passes through them and the rest of the board is filled with a nice ground plane. Here's what KiCad's 3D render of the board looks like and somehow PCBWay's board looks even better, so definitely go check them out. You can find these schematic and PCB files in my GitHub, but I would not recommend going out and manufacturing this board because of the faulty reverse polarity protection circuit which was different to the one I showed you in a previous video, which should work when the NCV68261 is put in one of the reverse polarity protection modes. Thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit those friggin' buttons and uh, comment down below if you have any suggestions or advice or criticisms. In the next video, I'll be showing you one of my projects for university which uses the new ESP32 S3 Pico chip and some cool power circuitry stuff that I've learned. If you'd like to further support my development, memberships and super thanks always help too. Later!